Ladies and gentlemen, in the blue corner, standing at a sleek 5'11", 245 pounds, the tumultuous tempest of technique, Thomas Lilly. And in the red corner, at a curvaceous 5'11", 315 pounds, the jovial juggernaut of judgment, John Cheryl Sheridan. A meeting of the masters of mastication. Turn your attention as they delve deep into all things lifting and more. This is Peak Speak. Let's count least... down together. So it's like three, two, one, clap. <laughs> okay. Right, ready? Three. Three, two, three, two one. <laughs> Alright, Sam, I don't know if the clap idea is working. The clap idea is not going to work quite the way we wanted it to. But I think having the Zoom recording as a reference, because it has both our voices. I think the problem he has is that both the video and the audio recordings mm. just have voice and then blank section because the sound's coming through the headphones, not through the uh, cameras. Yeah, I get you. So I think having the... <clears throat> combined uh zoom recording will make life easier and if not sam you're shit out of luck this is what we pay you the big bucks for um oh god also we're experimenting sam from my end with a new camera angle i would quite like it if you could just get me to be looking at thomas the whole time through the youtube thing but anyway and i'm i'm on a new angle because i've got this new desk and it's like a down angle it makes me look so slim yeah it's all about the the downwards angle poke the chin out the stick thing is the, it's in, stick the booty out it's in my spare room and it's got my keyboard in it so now the people are going to expect music dude why didn't you play the intro to our podcast i don't really know what to play well what kind of fucking musician are you i only play classical i have no objections to a classical music intro do you know who uh, Dream Theater is? I know of them, yes. So Dream Theater is a progressive rock band and their keyboardist, Jordan Rudess, is like one is of the Is that who you went and saw the other day? Yeah. So yeah, I, went, okay. I took my brother to, to go see him and we got VIP meet and greet things and uh, it was just absolutely mind-blowing what that guy can do with, with a piano, with a keyboard. He's invented his own instrument. It was just so, 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 so cool. Instrument? How do you yeah. invent your own uh, instrument? It's, yeah, incredible. So, like, I'm fascinated with anyone who has a passion for something that's kind of spanned for a long time and it's just the thing, you know? And people get really good at these things. I, I love people who take that thing and just perpetually push the boundary, push the limit, think outside the square. Like, that's so inspirational to me. Yeah, man, I, I'm the same. I think as I've grown older, I've come to appreciate more people who just have a passion for something, regardless of what yeah. that passion is. I mm. find like it, it's, it's especially relevant, I think, with like food and drink and things like that. Like I'm always willing to pay a premium for a product that someone really gives a shit about um, because mm. I think there's, there's a lot more in... Uh, the value of it when you know that someone's put their heart and soul into it um, compared sure. to like compared to something you can get as a mass produced you know thing off the shelf or whatever I think it's there's definitely value uh -huh. in spending money to get quality products so I guess we've kind of started the podcast now anyway yeah um, a little bit we kind of didn't how do you, that how are you John I'm good tell man us about tell us about this new comp Ah, uh, yeah. Well, it's not a new comp, so it's a new division. Um, so from our first novice comp for 2019 uh, and into the future, we're introducing uh, a new gender division. It's called the MX division, uh, which I believe stands for mixed, but I am hearing uh, mixed reports, ironically, on that. Um, it was an idea brought to me by uh, JJ Wearing from Sydney, uh, or it was proposed to a group of people... Um, and I really like the idea from the start. So it's a, uh, 
a third gender division essentially that allows a space for transgender non-binary uh, and intersex athletes who don't have the opportunity to compete in a in a gender category that aligns with who they are um mm. so it's something that i think to my knowledge is is a first in any sport in australia um which is pretty cool and i'm pretty excited to be sort of leading from the front on that one uh it was first introduced i believe in the uk uh, i don't know the federation off the top of my head but that's where uh it came to jj's attention um and yeah it's something that i'm really excited about we've had a heap of really positive uh feedback on it already um and i'm hoping that uh into the future we can get a heap of competitors and essentially expose a bunch of people that don't necessarily feel they have a place in sport to a sport that i i love and it's been a huge part of my life so that's just something i'm keen on sharing with a, a bigger group of people i think you know the really cool thing is because i'm planning to introduce this now after you I, I saw your post and everything i thought why why hasn't anyone thought of this earlier and why haven't we done it earlier exactly man i i think the um the thing is uh, you know, maybe people haven't taken that step because they have believed in the past that the market didn't exist. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is speaking more generally, so not about this issue in, in, in particularly, but it, from a business perspective, you never know who you market, uh, you, you never know who you're missing from your market. So for example, uh, if you've got a gym that's open from 3 p.m. till 9 p.m., if you don't allow, if you don't have access to the gym in the morning, you don't know who's not coming to the gym because they never say anything. You know, yeah. you don't know who would train in the morning. And even if you put the feelers out and you say, who would be interested in this? People may not speak up. Whereas if you just have that option there, more people are going to come out of the woodworks because that option has created that safety. Um, yeah. And I think this is a really cool step forward because we don't know how many people are sitting there thinking, oh, I'd love to compete, but... I just don't have, uh, uh, there's not a category for me. And now that there yeah. is, I mean, that door is wide open. Yeah, for sure. I think it's, um, yeah, it's a really exciting opportunity to promote the sport, I think, as a whole and the growth of the sport. Um, and, you know, like I've always thought that powerlifting is one of the most accessible sports when it comes to, mm. it's got a relatively low barrier to entry because almost everyone who's stepped foot in a gym at some point in their life has performed some version of a squat, a bench press and a deadlift. Um, it's something where there's no sort of minimum requirements. That's why we run novice comps. It's about opening that field to as many people as possible. And this is just opening another door. And I think that's a really positive thing in the long run. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to be at the, at the forefront of that, to be honest. I think it's yeah, really man, cool massive, to... Massive kudos to you. Uh, JJ from Sydney is a, is an amazing lifter. Oh yeah. Um, and he, he's very public about like his journey through this. Yeah. Uh, and it's been really cool to watch. Yeah, man. I'm excited. We're actually, um, I'm in the process of, uh, getting in touch with Janae Croc, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. uh who's actually going to be in Australia the week after our first novice comp for, uh, the like screening of a documentary about um their process uh oh, wow. from yeah going to matt to janae and um i am hoping really hoping that uh they'll be in town early enough that we can get them down here and uh have them attend the comp i think that'd be really cool um it would be cool yeah. to have someone of such a high profile uh yeah so do, do you maybe want to explain uh, who Janae Kroc is because you know we've been in powerlifting forever we yeah know, look that's a know. that's a good point so some people not might not uh know Janae's story um Janae used to be Matt Kros Krosleski I can never pronounce the last name I thought it was Crocozelli yeah maybe it's Crocozelli I don't know uh but it's it was always Matt Kroc if you've ever done a Croc row uh Croc that's row. Exactly. that's who they're named after um yeah, he was a guy who was a big powerlifter in the sort of mid two thousands. Do you reckon late? Yeah. Sort of, yeah, late. The mid, the mid noughties. Yeah, uh, and at that point he was insanely strong. Um, he a competed multiply equipped, squatted over a thousand, I think, 
I'm mm, not sure right. about his bench because I never really follow bench results. Um, and deadlifted a whole bunch as well. Uh, but was also just known for an incredible intensity and uh, some really crazy feats of just sheer craziness, really. <laughs> um, when it comes to training stuff. the And yeah, I'm not sure when they came out uh as transgender but there was a thing about it i remember there being a controversy about or like a someone out of them in a way that was more public than it needed to be yeah um, it was yeah it was about two years ago and it was, w- was it, it, was it only that far show. i feel i thought it was earlier than that but um yeah it was it was never something i paid a lot of attention to because i don't like paying attention to controversy and slander like that when it comes to yeah. strength sports um but uh yeah janae is now a very open uh transgender individual who is very open about the the process and promoting inclusivity and things like that so uh it would be really awesome to get them to come to town and, and attend a, a first comp like that but uh either way i'm excited for the comp i think uh both jj and andy from sydney are going to come down um and we're going to get a few others as well so should be really cool i'm really excited for it and uh and i'm hoping after that first one it just becomes a normal thing you know it's like the first ones there's definitely going to be a a bit of you know exposure around it and i would like there to be because i want it to be a a thing that people know about but at the same time, uh, I don't want it to become a spectacle. You know, I just want it to be a normal part of our comp. To be normal, exactly. yeah, exactly, because that's so, what it should be. Do you want to tell us when and where it is? Uh, yeah, so the first comp's on the seventeenth of February at Burley Strength, my gym in Canberra. Um, it is a novice powerlifting comp, so if you've never competed before, this is a great opportunity to compete. Um, it's something we do. We do like four novice comps a year uh and yeah this is the first one for the year we've actually got our final novice comp for the year two days from now on sunday uh we've got like 57 lifters i think signed up for that um nice. so that's gonna be a fun day and uh yeah then after that we'll open entries for the new one so that'll be in yeah in did, february did you say the 17th of feb i believe so yeah okay i think cool. it's the 17th let me just double yeah. check i'm pretty sure yeah, it's no, the no. 17th that makes sense feb 10 is a sunday yeah, so it'll be the seventeenth. <clears throat> awesome. Um, so yeah, man, that'll be that's really exciting. I'm I'm super keen for that. I actually on the subject of exposing more people to the sport, I had someone comment on the Facebook page, uh, on the post on the Burley Strength page, uh, yes. and this guy was like, "So, uh, can someone explain to me what powerlifting is? Because it was never actually explained anywhere in this oh, wow. discussion." So I think it's really cool to see a post from a. a powerlifting and strength training gym in Canberra getting so much exposure that someone who doesn't actually know what powerlifting is has read it. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a really positive indication on how the whole thing is going to come across. Awesome. But All anyway, right. what's new with you? Oh, not much, man. I uh, we, we officially changed the gym to ground zero the other day. Oh yeah, that's, so, that's news. You've got to talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Uh, been ptc for six years we turned six on november the 12th um in the last probably about a year i've been you know uh what had happened is you know over the years i've formed my own identity as a coach people recognize me as a coach rather than just ptc gold coast Uh, my online business has grown exponentially in the last sort of three years and that's what i've become really known for and i was you know coaching under ptc gold coast uh my athletes didn't have a brand to represent because you know if they're in new zealand the ptc gold coast is kind of uh yeah irrelevant yeah yeah they'll never step foot in the gym so if they want to wear apparel and represent the brand they say thanks to thomas lily or thanks to ptc gold coast yeah uh the problem with saying thanks to thomas lily is that uh that means my business is always limited by my own capacity so the business had kind of started bursting at the scenes needed to grow a bit brought another coach on board uh and created zero so zero with a w on the end zero weakness um, uh, to separate the brand from, from my gym. Yeah. Uh, and now moving forward, we've just moved location. It just makes sense to have everything under one banner to, for continuity of branding, for, yeah, continuity, for sure, man. continuity of identity, uh, social media, advertising, all that sort of stuff. It yeah. just makes sense to be one, one thing. So now everything's under the brand zero and the, 
the gym is obviously just a hub for me so i've called it ground zero nice i like that man um, i think that's really cool so and jump th- on the instagram page zero underscore weakness and check out the mural that, that we got done fuck in there, dude that looks so cool it's really so the, the story was i've got this artist at the gym maddie bro check him out on instagram his art is incredible yeah if he you've ever if, world. if you've ever seen big spray painted murals in a gym anywhere in the world it was probably matt <laughs> So yeah, he flies around. As fit. If you're in a world gym, you've probably got a mural. He does all the world gyms. Flies around the country doing these big murals. Um, and I've had, I've, I've been coaching him for. He's one of my longest standing members. I've been coaching him for over four years. Uh, he came pretty early in the piece. And when he came to me, he was squatting 180 kilos. Fast forward five years, and now he squats 375. And his ultimate goal is to squat 400. And so for years, I've been thinking, what can I get Maddie to do in my gym? You know, we had ideas. People would float ideas of paint so and so on the wall, like some famous powerlifter. I'm like, yeah, but when yeah, you walk into a I've gym, I've never like, liked see- that as an idea. The like, I if I'm gonna have posters and photos up, I want my lifters to be on the wall. Yeah, I exactly. Because I used to have posters of uh, famous lifters that you know I idolized for for a period. <laughs> yeah, but then it's, it's just it's- your little man cave. Exactly, and and people walk in, and they might be powerlifters, they might be semi experienced powerlifters, and they're like, who's that? Yeah. And so you have to explain it. So I thought, you know, I love having photos of my lifters on the wall. Uh, Matty is an incredible artist. He's one of my longest standing lifters, one of my best lifters, and he has this goal of squatting 400. It just makes sense for people to be able to walk in, see this mural and be like, man, that's an amazing squat. Because that's what they'd see if we put, you know, Milanichev or something. Yeah, like, yeah, that's exactly. Great, mur- great mural of someone squatting. Exactly. But now they can be like, wait a second, that's that guy. Yeah, uh, yeah. And those three guys spotting. Oh, that's him. That's the owner. That, you know, it's it's got so much more uh, meaning to it. Oh, for uh, sure, man. And it looks fucking awesome. Like, yeah, yeah, he, did yeah, yeah. he did an awesome job. I think it's really cool, and I love that as an idea. Yeah. Uh, so today's episode, we uh, I did a question and answer thing on Instagram when I was I, I can't even remember I was on the plane or whatever. Um, and a few people asked us, what's next? What's the next peak speaks? I thought, why don't we just do a question and answer? So here we are. Here we so are. Put the call out. Questions, um, answers, all of the things. I, re- I reckon we're going to start with this one uh, because I think you're really well placed to answer this. The question is, when is too young to start in powerlifting? Excellent. I think it's uh, it's a really interesting question and something that maybe wasn't as relevant like certainly when we were kids um Mm -hmm. because there's now a generation of people and i put myself into this category who have grown up lifting weights and now have children um and so and especially in my instance i own a gym my son's gonna grow up in a gym um Mm -hmm. he, he already spends heaps of time here and will inevitably spend more time in the future and i think there's been uh, this dogma, I guess is the best word to describe it, of people who think lifting weights is bad for children. Um, Mm -hmm. There's uh, talk about growth plates and the shortening of growth plates or the closing of growth plates and it's stunting Mm -hmm. growth. Um, I had a friend in high school who is, or it's just been one of those dudes who's just naturally jacked and strong from day one. And we always, and he was quite short. We always used to joke that he was so strong, but he'd sacrificed a foot of height in order to Mm. be as strong. But a lot of the science has proven that not to be the case. And I think uh, from a personal development standpoint, I think everyone can benefit from some form of physical training, right? That's why part of the reason I own a gym is so I can help spread that message. But I think a lot of people get stuck in the conversation between and differentiating between powerlifting as a sport and, and strength weights. training. Yeah, strength mm-hmm. training. And it doesn't have to be lifting weights, right? But strength training in general. Mm-hmm. Um, powerlifting is a sport. It is a competitive sport that a lot of people participate in, but it's not necessarily something that everyone who squats, benches and deadlifts does right like mm-hmm. just because you train in the gym and you squat bench and deadlift doesn't make you a powerlifter a powerlifter is someone in my opinion is someone who is training for a competitive sport and they have an end date there's a competition date it's not i'm going to do a comp someday it's i am training for this comp yeah using myself as an example i don't consider myself a powerlifter anymore that's not an identity that i hold on to because i'm not training for a comp i haven't lifted a barbell mm-hmm. in a long time 
uh, yeah. but instead I have other methods of training, like I'm rock climbing, things like that. So mm-hmm. from a long-term athletic development standpoint, um, and I know uh, Chad CWS talks about this a lot, uh, and a lot of other people in the, especially in the American system, where early specialization is a, th- a really big thing. Uh, the science and most of the science, in, to my understanding, surrounding this stuff pushes towards uh, variability in training in younger populations. So mm-hmm. the best athletes are the ones that play all of the sports as a kid because athletic qualities are wide and varied and need to be developed over time uh, through exposure to a variety of different stimulus. So, mm-hmm. you know, I always before I had a child, I always spoke about, uh, any child of mine, uh, doing little athletics, uh, some form of dance or gymnastics and team, like a team sport, like soccer or something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. That develops the athletic capabilities of running, jumping, throwing, catching, kicking, passing, all of those sort of things, as well as the body control benefits you get from something like gymnastics, right? That's where you're going to get this really nice exposure to a variety of different things. And training in the gym can be part of that, I think, Mm -hmm. uh, and should be part of that. But I think for most, especially like anything under like 10, what you need is just playtime. I think uh, Mm -hmm. Colin Webb from Panthers Powerlifting in Queensland does a fucking excellent job of this with his kids. Um, The (laughs) amount... The footage he puts up is the best. Man, the amount of stuff that you see Colin's daughters doing in the gym. And they're (laughs) like, they're kids who are growing up in a gym, you know? And I think there are so many positives to being exposed to a group of adults who in general are healthy, fit, strong, and motivated and Mm -hmm. in my experience and certainly in my gym just genuinely good people uh, I think that exposure is always going to benefit any child and then having the opportunity to play in a physical manner to pick things up and try and pick things up and try and climb on stuff and do all these things that kids are meant to do then over time it will develop into strength training you know if if they want it to if they don't that's fine too but it's certainly something Uh you can't push on a child I think if you're going to compete, even as an early teen, I don't think there's anything wrong with competing, but competing at 13 should look a lot different to competing at 25. Yes. Competing at 13 should never be all out max attempts where they're grinding for hours through a lift or anything like that. It should be about developing the understanding of body awareness and positions and motor skill so that every weight they lift is something that they can do perfectly. I don't think you need to let a young teen or an early teen put themselves in a position that's just going to risk injury. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think all of the lifting at that age should be done in a really controlled and and fairly methodical manner. And then that can develop over time. I mean, I started lifting weights at 15 and we did some really dumb shit in a gym. And I'm sure you did as well. Everyone Mm -hmm. I know who started as a teenager has done some really dumb shit at some point in their life and that's part of it i think as well is learning your boundaries on that front and things like that as well but you should certainly shouldn't be training five days a week as a 12 year old directed straight (laughs) towards a powerlifting meet right because i guarantee you you will burn that child out that child will fucking hate powerlifting and I think from a long-term standpoint, that's not what I want from my son. I, like, I want him to have the ability to lift weights for the rest of his life like I do because I think that allows you a whole range of options in terms of physical characteristics and capabilities uh, as you develop. I think everyone can benefit from being stronger. Everyone can benefit from being able to move a little bit better, have a little bit more capacity and developing that in an early it, early is important and specializing really early like just becoming a power lifter at 12 and doing nothing else is a bad idea yeah let me give you my two cents i'm a powerlifting coach right and yep. my mantra is if you're old enough to walk you're old enough to squat and i'm sick of these little kids with fucking excuses get under a bar load it up bend your knees and stand back up it's not hard no i'm just kidding um, um briefly on that uh matt vincent has joked about 
uh, the, or not joked about, but said seriously that uh, one of the best ways to be strong is to squat moderately heavy once a week for 10 years. And Kelly, <laughs> Kelly Sturette talks about how he's had his daughters squatting heavy once a week for several years now. And yep. he's, this is this long-term experiment. You fucking better believe that's what my son's going to be doing. <laughs> oh, my God, you can walk here. Just hold this, do some squats. All right, cool. Let's try that a little bit more next week. And we'll just develop it. And it'll, it'll be a fun experiment. So I'm going to echo everything that you said and, and keep my response pretty short as well. Yeah, sorry. Um, I got a bit ranty there. No, that's okay. You often do. We, we love you for it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'm going to echo everything you say. What I'm going to add is when it comes to the whole growth plates thing, the growth plates closing is a, is a result of hormones. So it's like, well, if you start lifting, it's a result of sex hormones. So if you start lifting, is there an increase in them? Yeah, well, maybe the slightest little bit, but nothing compared to the exponential there, increase there puberty. is when you go through puberty, right? Yeah, exactly. So maybe if you're 10 years old and, you know, you're... Uh, you're your super hyper coach dad decides to start injecting you with three mil of testosterone in a week. Maybe it might stunt your growth a little bit. Or your, or um, your Russian coach. Yeah. Uh, but for the most part, I think that argument is kind of a, a little bit null and void. Yeah. I think the important thing to recognize when it comes to strength training and powerlifting uh, is that, uh, like you were saying, there's a difference between the two, uh, especially in terms of specialty. But even if you're going down the specialist road, even if you're becoming a power lifter as a child, uh, your base needs to be broad. You need to be building a base. So look at any training method uh, that's got any sort of veneration around it. And there's a long period spent. It's like look at the Chinese weightlifters, the Russian weightlifters. There's a long period spent of just building a base, which is more generalized training. Um, the, the quicker you become a specialist and only exist to squat, bench and deadlift, the quicker you close off all your other options, all your other athleticisms, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so there's certainly no rush to do it. From, from my experience as a coach, coaching uh, children, so the first kid that comes into mind for me is a kid called Charlie who came to me to uh, get stronger to support his rugby. Now, this kid started with me. He still trains with me. He started with me when he was 13 years old. He was six foot two and 160 kilos. This is a large child. You imagine being 13 and being like five foot one and 60 kilos and having to try and tackle this monster running at you. I was um, not 13. I was not 60 kilos at 13, but even I experienced <laughs> that. We had a guy that I played against in high school who like was known as Big Ben. And he was a fucking, <laughs> it was a fucking monster. One of my most proud rugby achievements was catching a ball and deciding to run straight at him. And, <laughs> um, run straight. And the the collision was of an epic proportion, but I definitely came off best. Uh, so yeah, one of my most proud achievements. Excellent. Um, so Charlie, uh, we got him into powerlifting, but we never really pushed him because the sport was just like a bit of fun out of season while he was using the training to build strength for his sport. And then he switched into gridiron. He's done really well in that. And he's uh, part of the state team, part of a national team. He's been, I get a lot of emails from American colleges wanting to recruit him because I'm listed as a reference on their little profile thing they set up. He's, he's going to go far, this kid. He's Fuck a, yeah, that's really, awesome. Really good kid. But yes, I think that answers the question quite nicely. When I he's too it, young I to get into powerlifting. I, like, I don't really necessarily think there's a... There's an age limit to train and to do the sport, uh, but it's it's about uh, how you do that. How yeah, you context. That. It's about your context in training. Definitely. It's a lot different when you come to powerlifting at 22 after having trained in some form for six or seven years. But uh, yeah, it's it's all about context, I think, like almost every good answer to every good question. Yes. What's next? Okay, let me pull this up. Ba, 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 ba. Um, let's go into what is your biggest pet peeve as a coach and also a gym owner, which we both are. Correct. I feel like you have to start on this one. I've got a bit too ranty already so far this episode. Yeah, so this one's easy for me. I was actually talking to a good friend of mine uh, uh, yesterday about this. And the thing that probably annoys me the most as a coach and as a gym owner is kind of the external view on the coach-client relationship and this idea of ownership of clients. 
like this is my client, their results belong to me uh, because it creates an inherent saltiness for everyone. It's like, you know, if you take ownership of this client and this this conversation kind of ties into the whole idea of becoming friends with clients as well and being close. It, it, it removes it removes what the transaction actually is, which is a business transaction. It's like, I've got a product, you're a customer, you're coming to me to buy that product, here's the product. If I'm selling a cheeseburger and you want a chicken burger and I don't sell chicken burgers, if you go to buy a chicken burger, I'm not gonna be upset. Like that's a business decision. Uh, I think a lot of it comes from this kind of scarcity mentality, this idea that there's not enough clients to go around and it's like, if one client leaves one coach and goes to another, it's like a big deal, you know, oh no, they've left, what happened there? Was that coach not good enough? Is that coach bad? Is that, uh, you know, was there some falling out? Was there something a little bit more scandalous happening underneath? Maybe they just wanted a different coach. Exactly. Maybe, maybe they're still good friends. Like I, I've coached a lot of my friends over the years and it's like, well, this person's not competing anymore right now or they just want to try something different. Go and try something different. There's nothing wrong with that. It, it doesn't have to be a thing and people... Spend so much time investing energy into making things things. Don't make things things. Yeah, look, man, I I totally agree with you. I think I was I was definitely guilty of this early in my gym owner manager career, and I've gotten a lot better at it. And I I occasionally still catch myself doing it, but I think ultimately it, it comes down to definitely the scarcity mindset. Like abundance is the best thing when it comes to that the idea that um a rising tide floats all boats if yes. there are more powerlifting gyms or more strength training gyms more people lift weights crossfit is a fucking excellent example of this crossfit mm -hmm. has put barbells in the hands of a generation of people that never would have considered putting barbells in their hands otherwise exactly. it's made it's made lifting weights cool again um and that's fucking awesome uh am i a crossfit coach no can I help you develop aspects of a CrossFit competitive CrossFit career? Sure. Can I provide you with general health and fitness training that involves some strength in some conditioning stuff? Sure. But it's a different environment. It's a different product. I think uh, most of it comes from, I think, small-minded coaches who can't see that like people evolve beyond your coaching ability sometimes, but also... Mm -hmm uh like your skill set right if you're an elite level coach and you've coached elite level people then your top range for what you know is is useful and meaningful in training is going to be different to someone who's only really fresh out of their six week cert fall mm -hmm. so understanding your scope of practice is really important you know i'm i'm not a physio i don't pretend to be a physio i have a reasonable I think uh, uh, understanding of anatomy and physiology, but when it comes to things that I don't know, I send people to other people, you know, and yeah. I've, I've talked people out of being members of my gym or being under like being a, a client that I coach because my service isn't right for them and that's uh -huh. okay. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think uh, I certainly don't get emotionally attached to, clients coming and going that's not a thing that is productive in my life so i just don't do it um mm -hmm. but it's a choice and it's a choice you have to make if that's the road you want to go down uh yeah. but everyone likes to be offended and everyone likes to create drama out of nothing so i think it's an inevitable part of the process but i just avoid people who I avoid interacting with people who think like that and it works pretty well for the most part yeah and that emotional attachment is a big thing because it's like Oh, you know, I thought we were friends. I thought we had something going here. It's like, oh, hang on. It's not a friendship transaction. It's a business transaction. Yeah. I mean, what you were just saying there as well, I, you know, I coach a lot of coaches and yeah. I get a lot of coaches that come to me for a couple of blocks and then they're like, you know what? I'm going to go to this coach. I feel like I have more to learn. I want to learn their style. I want to learn different yeah. styles. And I'm always like, that's fucking awesome. Go learn from that person. Continue to expand your horizon because as a coach, your job is to develop your own philosophy yep. and by learning from other people, that's going to solidify what you believe and what you practice and there's nothing wrong with that. And if for you've... me, it's like, I, you know, I'm really stoked to have influenced that person and that they've taken a piece of my philosophy and, and been able to, you know, potentially decide that it's not for them or potentially decide that I'm going to take this and this and this and apply it to my own thing. I think that's really cool. Yeah, man. In the same way that I've got people at the gym who 
are members of the gym, but I don't write their training programs. I don't uh-huh. like, I don't coach them in that aspect, but I consult with them. There are people who I, I started off coaching and as they've gotten better at it and more into the process, they've started to write their own training. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that either. That's fucking my ultimate goal is to put yeah. you in a position where you have all the knowledge that I have, perhaps not the same range of experience because I do this for a living, but yep. you can have all of the requisite knowledge and start to develop your own training philosophy because I think mm-hmm. ultimately it works a little bit different for everyone. And so if you're the sort of person who wants to take ownership of your own training, I'm here to help facilitate that. If mm-hmm. you're someone who wants to rely on a coach and have someone who can give you a program to follow and things like that, that I can do that too. But the ultimate goal is always going to push you towards more independence. More often yeah. than not now as a coach, and I'm especially making a concerted effort at the moment to uh, answer less questions and ask more questions. So mm-hmm. when someone comes to me and goes, oh, I'm thinking about doing this, I go, okay, cool. Why? Or like, what's your reasoning behind that? Or just, just start to not pick holes in people or, or try and argue with them, but to help them understand what they're trying to do and what my answer is going to be because in the most cases in, in most cases the members of my gym know how i'm going to answer a question because yeah. they've heard me talk about enough different t- topics that they know that almost always my answer is going to start with it depends yeah or i don't yeah. know you know and i think that promoting this idea that you're sharing knowledge like part of the the business transaction is providing ongoing benefit. Like you said, it's that influence of being a part of someone's philosophy. And I think when you coach from a mindset that is, I'm here to provide everything I can to this person. And when they can no longer, when I can no longer provide something productive, then they will go somewhere else. That's a positive. I think that's the best way to to look at this. And hopefully in the long run, that's where we'll go. Because I think all of those coaches who, or at least a segment of those coaches who have that real scarcity mindset are going to go out of business because Mm. it's not a sustainable mindset. It's not a a business model that's sustainable either. For sure, man. And just expanding to, to kind of close off this question on something you said earlier, is that... Uh, it, it, there's more there's more to coaching than just programming and technique like what we do is not just provide programming and technique and there's there's a, there's an interpersonal relationship there like yeah. think of it outside of the context of coaching let's say you go get a, a massage for one hour and this massage therapist is the best right they're the best massage you've ever had they get all your tight spots they uh, their the, the practice is just amazing but you don't want you don't feel comfortable being in the same room as this person for one hour because they've got no interpersonal skills or your personalities just completely crash. Like there's this interpersonal element that just doesn't work for some people. Like it it, it doesn't work for some people. The other thing is like if you've got a coach uh, and you're constantly you know uh, saying coach by this person, coach by this person, and then you switch and everyone's oh why did you switch? But sometimes there's the online versus in person element as well. Some people just answered to a style of coaching or a medium of coaching. That doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with the client. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the coach or the coaching itself or the programming or the technique or anything like that. Sometimes these things just don't work together. Exactly. You know, it's, it's, I mean, our job as coaches is to refine our businesses and try and make ourselves uh, malleable as teachers across a broad range of personalities, learning styles, mediums, all of that sort of stuff. Experience but, levels, uh, well, things like that. We're humans, right? Yep. We're humans. We're always going to be limited to that capacity. Yep. And, uh, uh, and it's the same way in the other direction as well. So it just doesn't necessarily always work. And I, as, sorry, just to expand on that again, because we can go on about this all day. But on the developing a coaching philosophy thing, I still have this very vivid memory about when I started writing things for social media for PT, what was then PTC Canberra and is now Barely Strength. Mm-hmm. Um, I, for those of you who've been playing along from the start, like to swear quite a bit. Um, and when I started writing things, I was really careful to swear almost never. And what I came to realize was if you're the sort of person who's uncomfortable reading the word fuck in a blog about strength training, you're probably not going to be very comfortable in my gym. And so I decided to just go back to writing how I speak and my natural voice and being more of me because the people that want to be or that enjoy who I am as a person and and as, as a coach are going to 
come and the people that don't aren't going to come or they're going to leave and there's nothing wrong with either of those things um it's uh it's about just being i think authentic in who you are and understanding that your personality is not perfect for everyone yeah you can't fundamentally change who you are no and nor should you because otherwise you end up putting on this front of like you have to be on all the time and it's fucking tiring pretend we're back fam um should we just do one more? Yeah, I want to do the nutrition question. All right, let's do that. About um, the... Yeah, like how, how quickly food converts energy. Sounds good. And then maybe let's let's do the... After that, we'll do the PDs one. Uh, oh, just punch Buddy in the face. I didn't see him there. <laughs> we'll do the PDs one, but we can pretty much just refer to our, our injuries podcast because we talked about it in that. Yeah, cool. All right, let's do that. All right, we're back. <laughs> Great. Professionals. Okay, so um, the next question we're going to address is uh, one about nutrition, which is obviously far more your area of expertise than mine. Um, and so I'm just going to stand quietly and let you speak. But uh, I was asked about... Uh, essentially how quickly the food you eat is converted into energy that's available to use. Uh, I would like you to sort of frame that around eating before training in terms or competition and things like that. It doesn't have to get too specific, but I think, yeah, you can talk on that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I have to open this question John style and say it depends because it really does depend. Like rate of the, of the, absorption of nutrients can happen really fast or really slow depending on a few things depending on the combination of those nutrients in your stomach depending on the kind of food that those nutrients are coming from uh, depending on the amount that you eat um, so if we're kind of taking because that's a really broad broad sort of question if we're making it more specific and talking about eating around training right because a lot of people ask this question how close should i eat to training yeah. uh, what should i eat around training yeah, I th- and I think it's a good specific example of a broader subject. Yeah, for sure, for sure. How close you should eat to training really is a personal preference sort of thing because you could have like this global benchmark of, okay, two hours before training, have a meal that's rich in carbohydrates, kind of medium in protein and low in fat, uh, and that's going to be the best for performance. And you do that and you find that you get to training and you're absolutely starving and you can't focus because you're so hungry or you get to training and you feel like throwing up because you've got a a stomach full of food. It's really, really, really personal preference. And it comes down to your choice of food as well, because some people say, you know, eat it like a chicken and rice sort of meal, something easy to digest. And you might find that, you know, that sort of food makes you feel sick and you're better suited to pasta. So it's, it's really, it's really quite an individual thing. If I had to generalize it, I would probably stick around that global benchmark around two hours away, a, a meal that's rich in carbohydrate, medium in, in protein and lower in fat. And I say that because fat's going to be the longest to digest. Protein's a little bit slower to digest. Uh, rich in carbohydrate because carbohydrate is going to be the immediate energy source uh, to to provide you with energy during training. Protein's not really going to give you any energy, but it's important for you know protein muscle synthesis while you're going through and breaking down muscle. It's important to have that floating around. But nutrient timing becomes far more of a thing to consider as well if you're in a calorie deficit, because then it becomes pretty much solely around how can you in a deficit uh, have enough energy to perform when you need to perform. Um, because if food is in abundance, if you're in maintenance or if you're in a surplus, you're going to have energy pretty well most of the time. Uh, and it becomes less of a consideration. It's, it's more in that case, it's more of like timing it to make sure you don't feel sick while you train. When you're in a deficit, it's about, it's about being smart to time, uh, the right nutrients at the right time to make sure that you can perform. So you can still train even while you're in a deficit. So you can maintain as much muscle as possible while you're losing fat or while you're losing weight overall. Um, I think that kind of ticks the box, right? Yeah, for sure, man. I I know from um from personal experience, I think it also varies uh sort of lift to lift. Like I always found in competition, I will generally like on a competition day, I'll get up and eat a big breakfast because I like feeling reasonably full when I squat. Uh I then won't really eat much else because if I feel really full 
come deadlifts i feel fucking gross and slow and yeah shit. whereas worst feeling yeah whereas for squats i really like feeling like i've just eaten and like i feel full and ready to go and then i taper it off and you know just drink stuff and eat lollies and things like that like i'm not eating a substantial meal middle of a comp yeah. But I think a lot of it's also down to experimentation because mm-hmm. if you don't it, like start with that global benchmark and work your way up or down from there based on how you feel. I think um, yeah. it's also obviously going to be activity dependent. You know, lifting weights is going to be different to sitting on a rower for an hour. So um, yeah, I think experimentation is the key when it comes to finding what works for you. For sure. All right. We might close off with one question. One last question. Um we don't really need to get too in depth on this one because we've already covered it in our injuries podcast. So check that out. But the question is, do PEDs cause bigger injuries? Why do so many enhanced lifters put their quads, adductors and biceps? Do you want to start or do you want me to start? Uh, I'm happy to start. I think, like you said, we, we touched on this in a much more expansive way in, um, in the injuries podcast, but just briefly, it's, I think, yes, they do play a role in that because they change the rate at which your muscles grow and get stronger compared to your connective tissue. So your ligaments and tendons, you're not, uh, you're not training them in a way where they all get stronger and, and grow bigger at the same rate and you're artificially enhancing, or sorry, they already naturally grow and get stronger at different rates. And then when you artificially speed up one of those rates, you're going to create a weak link in that chain. So Mm -hmm. the injury risk, I think, is probably greater for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I want to say I think there might be some sample bias because we see it more often. You don't know what you don't see. So, uh, but anecdotally and from experience, I'd kind of agree with the statement that uh, people using PEDs do tend to suffer more catastrophic injuries. Uh, Like I've been to a lot of comps in the last 12 years and I've only ever seen really big catastrophic injuries at uh, untested meets rather than tested meets. Um, The uh, the other facet of it is that... um, I think it comes down to, I I don't think the statement on its own because the statement on its own kind of inherently implies that if you go on PEDs, your risk of catastrophic injury is higher. And I don't think that's the case necessarily uh, because you think of what PEDs are actually doing at that given point in time. It's like giving you a boost. It's like giving you a little push up just as if you were in a calorie deficit for a long time and you started eating properly, just as if you'd never lifted weights in your life and you started lifting, you're going to get this kind of newbie gain, this instant boost, all that kind of stuff. I think improper use or abuse is more likely to lead to those catastrophic injuries just because all of a sudden, especially when you get people that jump on more and more stuff coming into a comp because they think they take more, they lift more. And and to a degree, The more you take, the more you make. (laughs) Yeah. So the, um, you know, if your uh, if your max squat is 250 kilos and then you uh, enhance yourself to have uh, you know a super max squat all of a sudden in three weeks and you try and squat 270 kilos, there's a big potential that something's gonna give. Yep. The thing is like uh, you know your your strength is limited by your ability to stabilize your positions, right? Your your ability to ex- express your strength is limited <coughs> by your ability to uh, stabilize your position. Yeah. So all of that's a sudden, a, that's a get... better definition when you use the word express rather than just yeah. strength. For sure. Exactly. Exactly. So all of a sudden, when you have something boosting your ability to express strength, if the underlying stability isn't there, there's more opportunity for things to go wrong. So the principles are still exactly the same. It's just that when you don't have that boost, you're limited by the stability. When you yeah. when you push past those limits, that's when something's got to give. And that's yeah, where you exactly. normally see catastrophic injuries because people say, oh, no one saw it coming. You know, there was no sign of it coming. Well, it, it's because you've never been past the point where you've been able to express the sign of something potentially being wrong. Exactly. Um, yeah, look, I think that covers that really well. If you want to find out more about that, you should definitely go listen to our injuries podcast episode. I don't know what number it was because mm. i don't know, even know what number we're up to um, i do believe it was number nine but i could be wrong and often am wrong so just go listen to all of them yeah you may as well and while you're at it you should give us a five-star review um leave a sassy comment if you're into that sort of thing maybe we'll share it maybe we won't um you should also tell your friends 
you should awesome. share this on Instagram and tell us you're listening because we really enjoy seeing all of that stuff. Um, it's cool to have people tell us they're listening to us because, you know, Thomas and I quite like just talking to each other. It's fun and it's nice to know that people enjoy our conversations. Excellent. See you all next time. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>